Two Tone Pony is the name of the band, David Kirkpatrick. Uh, good to see you, David. Um, you know, out, out of retirement, you know, this is sort of the next phase of the working career, uh, really, isn't it? Well, yes. Thanks, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, if you spoke to my wife, she'd say you're busier than you were when you were working. So, uh, uh, yes, it's it's certainly something that's taking my time. But I tell you what, it's really enjoyable and uh it's uh, it's a big learning experience because you know I've been around the music business even though I'm being a doctor I've been around the music business my whole life and spent a lot of time in recording studios uh, with my family watching them record and things are a hell of a lot different now than what they were then. <laughs> There's that old saying in music, isn't it? That it's not brain surgery, but you've kind of had the experience of surgery in the past anyway as a doctor. Yeah, so, you know, you, you're you probably right. the best person to ask about that. Is, is the music industry brain surgery? Yeah, no, it's not rocket science, but I'll tell you what, it's, uh, it's still very interesting. You've got to learn all the little lurks and, you know, the loopholes and the way to get around the system these days. Yeah. Well, let's get right to the point. The uh, the yeah. thing that people want to know most, who owns the Purple Mustang? Good story there. Um, as we know, Two-Tone Pony, it's, it's, uh, that's the name of the band, and it takes its name from the late mid-60s to 70s American Ford Mustang GTO convertibles, the real muscle cars of the day. And a Two-Tone Pony was one that has a nice, you know, another tone stripped down the side. And... Uh, we were playing a gig in Sydney uh, last year, and one of our um, sorry about that. I'm just moving. <laughs> one of our uh, m uh, mates from school, uh, John Guest, turned up and watched the band. And after he said, "Hey, by the way, I own one of those. I've got it back at home in my uh, in my garage." And actually, he'd actually moved up to the Central Coast where I live, and uh, he was five k's away from me. So <laughs> we drove it around to our place, and uh, we were able to get some really good band shots with it. What a car. What a car. Have you seen the uh, the new Mustang, the Dark Horse? The very last manual uh, Mustang is about to be released. Wow. No, I haven't. No, I haven't. I have a couple of friends who are real car, you know, nuts, and one of them had a bright red Mustang about five, six years ago that he drove up to the coast to show me. <laughs> well, I guess no one can use the name Dark Horse as a band name because the Harrison family, the Harrison estate, uh, already own that. Uh, yeah, George yeah. Harrison has the Dark Horse record label. And, you know, yeah. maybe you should give Danny Harrison a call and get uh, Two Tone Pony signed to that label. That's right. Maybe we should. We're, that, that can be our international uh, international distributor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you've got to weigh in. Actually, it's not a bad label. You've got Cat Stevens. He just signed Cat Stevens uh, a few weeks oh, ago. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's so you know, maybe maybe you should be giving him a call. <laughs> <laughs> I can dream on. Yeah. yeah. So the band uh, Two Tone Pony, uh, run us through the band members and how you all got together. Well, the the nucleus of the band is um, got together in uh, early 2018 when my daughter Hannah came to me and said uh, she was getting married. And she said, I want you put a band together for me, Dad. And... Uh, but I wanted to be a country rock band because at that stage when I was working, I was um, I'd been playing in various cover bands around the coast just to keep my musical hobby alive, and uh, I said, "Yeah, great, I've got the time now." So um, yeah, so the first person I recruited was my brother-in-law Greg Richardson on drums and percussion, and Greg's uh, been around the sound. He's a sound engineer and studio manager, and was for Radio National for over thirty years and played in bands, a lot of the ABC bands, et cetera. And um, then I had two other mates of mine from the coast, um, Ian Rhodes, who's the other singer songwriter in the band, the man who came up with Two Tone Pony because he wrote a song with, that, with those lyrics and that's where we took the name from. And Graham Puglisi on bass, and they'd been playing in bands for 20 plus years with me. And then we were putting some demos down and then I thought I decided I needed some keyboards on it. So I contacted my mate, Glenn Willie, and in Sydney. And uh, Glenn was a bloke who came up to me in year 11 at school and said, hey, I hear you play drums. Do you want to join a band with me? So I've been playing with, uh, with Glenn since year 11, all through university, and always kept in touch. And, uh, and then he really, really enjoyed the, the music, and it was a new challenge for him as well. So 
he uh, he jumped right in. So there we are. That's 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 where we are. We're all been playing music all our lives. We're all music heads. Yeah, and then Glenn's ex-wife Michelle contacted me, and there we go. <laughs> and, and somehow we got to you. <laughs> It's all the network of people you know, isn't it? I mean, and I, you can thank my daughter, Hannah, uh, who incidentally, when you listen to the, the, the song we've just released, it's her doing the harmony vocals with me on, in, during the choruses. And uh, she was pregnant at the time, I do believe. <laughs> That's right. She had to drive up from Sydney to the Central Coast, uh, drop one son off at uh, preschool, drive up the coast, she was six months pregnant, get up to the studio, nailed it in like two or three takes, turned around and headed back home. We were all sitting back in awe of it. <laughs> Does a fetus in a womb in a studio during a recording session get a credit? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> she hasn't asked me for that yet. I, well, I mean, if anyone knows she does, she she works for Sony Music Australia. She's head of licensing and sync. So she, if anyone had known, she'd be able to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, might be getting some legal papers from your daughter. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So she's she's had the baby, obviously, by now. Boy she's or had girl. the second baby. Yes, that's right. She's at home now on, on maternity leave. So she's got little Hartley at home, and he's uh, just about to turn six months. Yeah. Right. So you're a newfound grandfather. Well, for yeah, the well, time. That's, yeah, that's right. That's for the, that's the fourth grandchild. I've got a son in uh, Adelaide with two grandkids. And uh, and Hannah, who lives in Sydney, yeah, with two kids. It's quite the musical family, isn't it? Uh, you know, with your well, heritage into you know what your sister Anne was doing, uh, now yeah. what you're doing, and if Hannah's singing too, they, we've got three generations of Kirkpatrick's along the way. Oh, oh absolutely. I mean, yeah. So grew up, I and mean, I was literally born on the road while my parents were, were traveling. Um, and that's why I was born in Rockhampton in Queensland, because the show was travelling up the East Coast doing the agricultural show circuit at that stage. And I, um, so mum stopped at Rockhampton. The show went on to Cairns, mind you. Uh, and I was born. And then a week later, we rejoined the show. Uh, and then I lived in caravans for the next six and a half years and uh, before I ended up going to boarding school. But, and uh, then, of course, my sister Anne Kirkpatrick um, had her own musical career and it was Anne who really introduced me to more the country rock sort of scene of the of the 70s in particular when I was um, playing in rock bands for uni and got me into the Flying Burrito Brothers, Graham Parsons, Emmylou Harris, Rodney Crowell, the Birds in that in their country rock sort of era. So that's I've always loved that as well as all the rock influences and uh, even the I guess the the rock musicians I like have always had. You know, I mean, I, I love the Rolling Stones, and you know, Keith Richards and Graham Parsons were great mates for a while. And the Stones have actually written some really nice country songs. Oh yeah, um, albeit about junkies and etc., which is a little different to normal. But yeah, <laughs> well, I think that was the Graham Parsons era, wasn't it? They were I think I think Keith was heavily influenced. Unfortunately, Graham was very into that. Unfortunately, which was his undoing, very sadly. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've, look, I've, I've been around music all my life. Um, I have a wide variety of tastes, and, and that's reflected really in our music. I mean, you know, we've recorded six tracks with Rod McCormack um, last year. We've just released our first song, but we run the gamut from the acoustic ballad sort of material that, and then right through to electric, you know, even blues rock in a way some of our songs so there's lots of different influences from the band and we're marrying it all together and that just yeah i think i think we're starting to find our own own sound now because we've had four years now honing it and of course covid came along so we couldn't get out and play live but we couldn't even rehearse together for a while but yeah we, we i think we're at the stage now where we've been playing together long enough to get our own identity which is great well, uh, speaking of that diversity of sound, uh, in the video for A Life Well Lived, I think Graham's wearing a Joy Division T-shirt, isn't he? Is, is, that, a, is that a mark of rebellion? Uh, well, this all came about, see, because we we had Jeremy Minnett from um, Eyes Plus Ears Creative did the, the video, so I give a shout-out to him. And 
Um, he's a you know younger up and coming videographer. He's also a very talented musician as well and, and, and singer and guitar player. And he came up, uh, we shot it at Ian Rhodes's Bush Block up at Buckety on the Central Coast. So, and Jeremy came and you know, we all had our fancy shirts and all our gear ready to, you know, to get changed into. And he said, well, no, listening to the song, I just want a bit more relaxed vibe of sort of you just turning up at someone's place, you know, sitting around in the lounge room, chatting and playing. And then later on, we can change. So we all sort of just had t-shirts on that we were just wearing up there. We weren't thinking that we're going to be in the, in the, in the uh, video with it. Hence, hence Graham's Joy Division t-shirt and my crummy old t-shirt that I had on as well. So um, it, but I think it works. So it's, it turned out for the, he knew what he was doing. Is the title A Life Well Lived a nod to your parents? Well, you know, it, it is. It was, um, it, it came about, it's obviously not, it's a phrase that's that's well known, and I used it in an introductory speech. I had the honour of introducing my mother, Joy McKean, in the getting her lifetime Ted Albert Achievement Award at the APRA Awards, Australian Performing Rights Association Awards in Sydney, and I used that phrase because I couldn't think of a better person that, that that personified a life well lived and an interesting life. So yeah. So I used that, and then afterwards, uh, I was, you know, I, when I was writing, and I, I had the chords and had a melody, and I, I used that phrase, and then I just made up the imaginary neighbour and thought about going in and chatting and talking to someone like that and asking them what do they reflect on. You know, you talk to people, you know, what they reflect on. Tell us about your past, and they'll tell you about important things which is their family their friends their relationships you know that's and whether they felt they had a good life and did the right thing or had the right thing done by them they don't tell you about big car or big money or big house and that's what i wanted to show in using that phrase and using using the, the example of your neighbor and the person actually the narrator of the song coming to the realization that's exactly what he would like in life as well if you've got uh, six recorded songs, that means you're well on the way to an album. Is that yep. what the plan is for later this year? Yeah, we're, we're going back in the studio with Rod again, uh, Rod McCormack in May. We'll put down another four to six tracks and we'll at least, we'll, we'll release one or two more singles over this year and we'll look to uh, drop an album either at the end of this year or maybe early next year. But that's right. We, you know, we've got, I've got, a lot of stuff a lot of we've got a lot of material and we're, we're writing all the time rehearsing new stuff um and yeah we you, you're sort of in a catch-22 that you want to get out and play your music for people but if you're going to get your foot in the door in a festival or somewhere you've got to have something to show people what you've done or a bit of a track record so yeah we we now we've made that first step we've got our first single out we're getting good airplay we hope that continues can do do a few more and that will hopefully relate into us getting out there and doing what we really love doing, which is playing live. So how do you fill the set list then? Uh, are there covers that uh, fill in the original songs? Yeah, uh, it's probably about a 70-30 mix. Um, I always reckon that you, you know, you, you, you've you got to play your own stuff, but you can't test an audience's patience too much, especially if you're doing, you know, a... a, a you're playing a, like a three hours, you know, spot at a, at, at a pub or a club. You got to have a, you got to have some stuff that they know. Um, so we we do some JJ Kale covers. We do some Tom Petty covers. We do the old, we do Buffalo Springfield for what it's worth. It's one of our favourites. Bit of Credence, um, yeah, a bit of Neil Young. Um, so yeah, we they're, they're the sort. Of, so you can sort of pick our influences by the the the, uh, the stuff that we're putting in there. And uh, and of course, I open every second set. I always open with an acoustic myself and a rendition of uh, Slim's "Looking Forward, Looking Back" because that's an important song that I like doing. What a great song! Yeah. What a great song! I'm like, you know, another in, in what people thought was an unlikely. Um, alliance between Don Walker, the 
course, from Cold Chisel, who wrote that song, and and Slim. But Don actually wrote quite a few songs for Slim, and uh, absolute great great songs, and uh, suited suited Slim down the ground. They got on like a house on fire. It's very disappointing. There's no joy division in your set list. <laughs> yeah, I think Graham's very disappointed. <laughs> Definitely where he comes from. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how uh, active are you in the in the family business, uh, the Slim Dusty Centre in Kempsey, for instance? Is that something that, you know, are you hands-on at all with any of that? Yeah, I'm the chairman of the Slim Dusty Foundation. Um, COVID was very difficult, you know. I had 24 hours notice to close it, you know, with COVID. We had to stand our staff down um, and we had to just close the place up, like, many other businesses and museums and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it was very difficult financially. So the last two years I have spent in uh, finalising negotiations with Kempsey Shire Council to actually transfer the building uh, and the maintenance and running of the building across to the council, which we've now signed off on. And they're very excited and they're, they're doing really good things. The actual museum, the memorabilia, the exhibits remain the property of the Slim Dusty family. With, and my sister Anne is very actively involved with the curator and involved in looking at new exhibits and uh, new, you know, new material. We've got so many, as you can imagine, the memorabilia we've got is amazing. It's a never ending source of stuff that we could put out there. So it was well, probably very, I've been involved in that. 10 years plus so yeah very hands on and what about the archives um have, have, have you totally mined the music archives yet or is there more to come we pretty well mined any yeah recorded stuff yeah we, we have um slim was pretty prolific in putting stuff out um and we yeah I, I, there's really no more material per se to put out there's maybe some live uh, material that, that we could potentially look at. Um, there's songs that are unrecorded, which is always, you know, something we might look at in the future. Um, but yeah, he pretty well got through most of his uh, most of his material. He didn't leave much in the can. He he worked until he could no longer stand up. Basically, he he was determined to finish that last songs he had, and uh, he. He wanted to, to keep going right to the end, which he did. So the unrecorded songs, uh, is, is that something Two-Tone Pony could look at? Yeah, well, that is an absolute possibility. I mean, there is stuff there. To be quite honest, I haven't really mined through it all. Um, there's, uh, yeah, it's it's a, daunting, a daunting prospect, actually. There is um, boxes and boxes of cassettes with ideas songs and other people have sent in because slim did a lot of putting other people's lyrics to music as well as writing his own lyrics and he was very good at taking people's lyrics and putting putting them to a and i guess that's there's lots of written material there but yeah i've got to listen to the tapes so yep maybe I know, never shut the door on anything. I could say this, uh, David Kirkpatrick, for somebody who has recently retired, you're not going to have a lot of spare time. <laughs> you're absolutely right. And uh, you know, don't you echoing the sentiments of all our spouses <laughs> telling this, this. They said, I thought we were going to go away, re you know, relaxing and, and you're recording. And yeah, but no, they're, they're cool. They think it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've got four grandchildren to start working into the family business. Yeah, you got to <laughs> Anything you don't finish, they can. <laughs> there you go. What a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Good to talk to you, uh, David. And hopefully we see Two Tone Pony around the country instead of, you know, just in that little pocket of New South Wales. Yeah. Yep. Well, so do we. Um, you know, we're, we're working hard at the moment, um, getting our music out there, getting our faces out there. And, um, I guess really concentrating into 2024 of getting out on the road and touring. So uh, we've got our first uh, you know, out-of-state gig at uh, Charleville, actually, in Queensland in July. So that's that's going to be fun. Um, so it's uh, the, the halfway shindig. They put it on the, um, the weekend before the Big Red Bash because they're halfway between Brisbane and Birdsville. 
And so they always get a lot of people coming through at that time of year. So they're putting on a, a, a music festival on that day. And uh, so we were lucky enough to be contacted to go and do that. So looking forward to that. And we hope to do a lot more of that stuff. And hopefully we get down to, to Melbourne and see you. Well, David, thanks for joining us here today at Noise 11. Great. Thank you very much, Paul. See you later.